Hi, this is Justin Coletti. You may know me from Sonic Scoop. Today I am with Sonarworks, and we get to have an awesome panel discussion with some amazing composers and producers as well for film, television, video, all sorts of mixed media. And this is really exciting. We've got one composer who's been an uh, Emmy winner, nominated for like 10 Emmys. We have another producer who's worked with amazing hip hop artists like J. Cole, and just people who have just uh, some incredible experience in this field. And we hope to make this conversation relevant to those of you who maybe aren't in film production or film scoring yet, but want to get into it. I think there'll be some insights for those of you who are interested in this field, as well as insights just for kind of music lovers and lovers of film in general. Uh, without further ado, let's kind of get right into the introductions. The only thing I want to do first is a big shout out and thanks to Sonarworks for making this conversation happen. You'll probably notice I am wearing my awesome Sound ID jammies. For those of you who don't know, Sonarworks is now Sound ID Reference. So the Sonarworks reference product that so many of you have been using to correct your headphones and your speakers, now known as Sound ID Reference. I've got the jammies on. Jason Suda has got the jammies on. You're looking sharp. I think super sharp. And just so you know, Christopher and Lolita, who are also on the call, these are their actual pajamas. We couldn't get them the <laughs> official pajamas in time, but they've got these. All right. So I just want to give some quick introductions before we get right into the first questions. I'm going to start off with Lolita Ridmanis. And she has won an Emmy. She's been nominated for almost a dozen of them. Lately, she's actually just worked on uh, music for a film called Blizzard of Souls, which won the Hollywood Music in Media Award, and it's been shortlisted for the Academy Award. So fingers crossed. We'll know pretty soon whether or not uh, it's a nomination for that. So really excited to have her on. Lolita, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure. Awesome. I'm going to keep going around and do a couple more introductions. Our next uh, big name here is Jason Suda. And Jason is a composer songwriter. He recently scored for a movie called Followed, which actually was like one of the number one grossing films in the United States around when quarantines hit because this horror movie played in drive-ins. So this is like probably the first time in a long time that a, a drive-in movie was one of the biggest grossing uh, movies in the United States. Really excited to have him on. He's done a ton of writing for both, you know, in the studio, conventional music releases, as well as sound and picture. Jason Suda, thanks for being here with us. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. All right, great. And last but not least, uh, in your bottom right-hand corner here is Mr. Christopher Ray. And Christopher Ray is a producer. He works out of a place called In-House Music and Sound, where they've got a ton of composers working for them, where they work on music, sound design, mixing, and mastering, mostly for commercials. But he has also worked in film and television and just in music, playing with the Butch Walker Band, playing with Licky Lee, and uh, doing production with some major hip-hop artists like J. Cole and Schoolboy Q. So super excited to have him on. Christopher, can you say hi to the nice people? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. All right, good stuff. So let's get into our first question here. I'm really curious, you know, things have changed so much over the past several years, and of course, especially in the past year, where people are working more and more in smaller rooms. And this being true, even when it comes to major motion pictures, the way we work has changed, the places and environments we work have changed. So I'd love to get some, a sense for you about how things have evolved over your career. Lolita, hopefully I'm not being presumptuous to think that you have been in the film scoring world for almost your entire professional career. So I think you'd be a great person to ask a little bit more about this. Can you tell me, give me a sense for how things were in the beginning of your career, the kind of spaces you were working in and what things are like now? Well, actually, when I started in this business, um, it was all uh, written, music was written by hand. <laughs> it sounds like the dinosaur era. Um, I mean, of course, you could, you could, you could play and record uh, uh, demos and have somebody else transcribe it. But when you wanted to have a, a, the sound of an orchestra, you actually recorded a, a live orchestra and you would work on the music at home with just your, with your keyboard. And so I started in the era where, where all the big recording stages, the big sound stages were, were hopping. There was always something going, a lot of musicians. 
uh, had work. Um, and then with the, as, as sample libraries became more and more prevalent and as, as also all sorts of interesting sound design kind of tools that for composers that are wonderful right now, as all that came into play that, um, people were producing more and more things in their own environments. And it became a, you know, you, you better gear up, otherwise you're going to be out of work. So it's now, I think it's, it's, uh, it's not that, that electronics and samples have replaced everything and home recording, but it has, it is, it's a tool that we have to have and we have to be able to work in our, in our own environments and produce really top quality sounding uh, material. And even then, when we take it to the recording stage, you know, it's, it's still important that it sound good in our own environment as well. So oh. Absolutely. Jason, uh, you look like you're in a very kind of accessible room, something that a lot of people can relate to. Can you tell us a little bit about the space you're in and the kind of spaces you're using to create music today? Yeah, sure. So yeah, I'm obviously not in an ideal studio environment. Um, you can't quite see, but either side of me, it's completely open. So it's not even an actual room. It's kind of like a, a breakfast nook. Um, and obviously behind me, there's I, there's no sound panels. I've got some panels up in front of me, um, but I'm working on speakers. And um, but I was on completely on headphones before I had SonarWorks reference available. And then once I tried that, it was really night and day the difference between having it on and off as far as correcting the the sound of the room. So now I'm able to work on speakers at home, and things translate to to my uh, collaborators studios or to the car if it's a record or whatever so that that has really made it possible for me to work here and so especially now with quarantine as well like being able to work from home since most of us are having to do that at least for the first part of last year um yeah so it's all really <laughs> you know i can't go on about it enough really how great that program is and it's right. Really, uh, yeah, has possible, working yeah. from home been a thing that's been happening for you like this past year when so many people have started to work at home? Or is that an evolution that began before then? Um, for me, it began before then. I, I did have a studio um, for probably a year and a half or something like that at a composer studio in Santa Monica. Um, and then I, I moved my stuff home just to like for economic, you know, to keep things a bit more economical since I wasn't needing the biggest spaces for everything. Um so yeah, but now now that we're having to be at home even more, it's 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 allowed me like I didn't have to stop the machine, you know, I was already here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like some of my friends had to like pack their stuff down and leave Warner's really quickly and stuff like that. So Yeah, yeah. understood. Uh Christopher, same question to you. Have the kinds of environments you've been working in and that your collaborators have been working in, have those changed significantly in, in recent times for you? Um, not so much. I, I've always kind of loved to move around and work in environments that aren't my studio. So, um, for, for example, last year before quarantine hit for the last like couple of years, uh, there've been a couple of projects where I've gone out to the Ace Hotel in Palm Springs and just set up a studio there, uh, and worked out of, uh, that hotel for like a week or two at a time. Um, which I, I just love getting out of, I love this space. Like I love my studio very much, but just getting out of here sometimes and working remotely just kind of clears the head. Um, and I don't know, I just kind of feel a, a renewed vigor for, uh, being creative. Um, so I, I'm, I'm used to moving around studios. And also when I'm, when I've been on tour with Butch, uh, Walker, there's been times where I've been working on films as well as commercials, like while on a tour bus. So it's like kind of, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy going from, you know, every day on tour is the same. Like it's like the same day over and over and over again. And, but every day, you know, you have like from usually like noon to four thirty with kind of like nothing to do. And that was always like my working. That's whenever I would work. So I would either be set up in a hotel room or backstage or on the tour bus itself um, getting work done. So uh, the, the mobile rig is extremely important to my work. Yeah. <laughs> and what's the context like uh, for you when you're working mobile? Is there a trusted pair of headphones? Do you end up running the sonar works, the reference stuff on it? Or do you listen on small speakers? What, what ends up working for you in those super remote situations? I'm usually on headphones. I recently started using those. Um, God, I'm going to mess up the reference, but like the, the Odyssey, mm -hmm. uh, like 4, 4ZX or something. I, I'm forgetting the exact name of them, but I've been, I've been using those quite a bit, uh, whenever I'm on the road. And I also have these little bitty Adams A3Xs that I use mm. with me. 
Um, here at my studio, I use the barefoot MM26s. Um, and to be quite honest, this work, this, the room that I'm in now was kind of unworkable before I got sonar works. I like looked into so many options on what I needed to do. There's this like low frequency resonance that happens in here where when I have my headphones on and I'm like messing with a kick drum, you know what I mean? Like I'll, I'll, I'll trigger the kick and on my headphones, it's just stiff. It's like, boom, boom. And the second I put it on the monitors, it's like, boom, boom. <laughs> like this huge resonance in my room. And it made working in here, like I said, impossible with monitors. And uh, a composer buddy of mine, Jonathan Sadoff, said, dude, I've been using Sonarworks. You've got to check this out. Uh, and I, I got it. And I, it for real has changed the game for me. Sweet. Yeah, it's totally true that really your speakers are only as good as your room, ultimately. And you can have the fanciest, you know, $20,000 set of speakers. But if you can't trust what your room is giving back to you, a lot of that's lost. And Big time. Um, yeah. And there's acoustic treatment is a great thing to have. I have acoustic treatment here. This is my new home studio that I moved into fairly recently. So I still have some of it on the ground and I'm a big believer in it, but there's just such a difference when you go in and do some of that EQ correction where you can even out things for, because at a certain point you got to spend thousands in acoustic treatment, or you can spend a handful of hundreds of dollars on something like a uh, sound ID reference and then solve so much of that problem uh, by going at it from both angles instead of you one. Know, I kind of, I kind of think about it too, is like, how hard are you, dri you driving that software? You know, I think it's like, if you can treat your room a little bit, you're not asking so much from sonar works. Like you right. want it, it can, it can go the rest of the way to get it done. But, you know, I'm, I'm like a power user because I have done nothing in this room treatment wise. And I'm asking a lot of the software um, and it's, it's performing. So, I mean, yeah, you're right. I, I should go through here and get some panels up. I mean, I do have panels in here. I have panels everywhere, um, but they, they, they haven't really affected that low end resonance. The hardest um, thing to get to, yeah. You so have to hard. either go into precise bass trapping or super thick corner treatment. And at a certain point, it's like, give me the software and uh, yeah. we'll, we'll solve a lot of that right exactly. away. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. No, I totally know the feeling. All right. Uh, absolutely uh, good place to start the conversation. But I think a lot of people are going to be interested in, um, we're going to have a lot of musicians listening to this, producers, engineers. And I know Lolita comes from the background of being a traditional composer, like kind of like an academic background of writing out music by hand and then segueing into scoring for film. I think uh, you two, Christopher and Jason, have a little bit more of a background of the uh, conventional studio, pop, rock musician kind of person. So I'd like to get a sense for each of your stories, and maybe we can learn something about what are the paths in for new people today. So let's do a two-part question. The first question I'll give you all is, what was your way in? And then in a little bit, I'd love to follow up and ask advice for others who are looking to transition into doing sound to picture for today. So uh, let's start this off this time uh, with Jason. We'll start off with Jason on this one and uh, give us a sense for your journey here. Okay. Um, so I was a singer songwriter completely before I got into film music. So I would be, you know, playing shows and venues and had a band and, and I did some producing as well with, with like other artists and all that. Um, but film music was always something that I wanted to get into, but I had no real idea of how to how to you know break into that world. And also, I didn't really have a very traditional music education, so I you know all of my music education was based on like producing and recording and using Cubase or MIDI stuff. So I was quite strong on that front. But if you ask me to like sight read a, a piano piece, I would be like, Ugh. I can tell you it's in C major. That's about it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I guess I was I was living in LA at the time, which which definitely helped. Um, and my main segue, which was a completely crazy night, um, I I got invited out to have a drink with a friend who was a, also an artist from the UK, and uh, so we're we're hanging out, and he has a friend with him, and she's from London as well. And she was asking me, like, what do you do? And I was like, I'm a singer-songwriter, but I'd love to do film music one day. And she was asking me a lot of really specific questions about it. So I, I was like, how come you know so much about it? He's like, oh, my dad's a composer. I was like, oh, okay. And then later on that day, uh, that night, sorry, we were in a, a bar in Venice. And she said, oh, his studio is just down the street if you guys want to come check it out. And I was like, yeah, I love studios. And, and then at the time, I had no idea who she was or, you know, I was expecting some kind of bedroom studio or something or, you know, whatever. So we get there and... um 
there's like three or four massive buildings. She's pointing like that building's my dad's, that building's my dad's, this is my dad, blah, blah. And then there's a secure, an armed security guard. This is probably like two in the morning. And he's like, oh, is it okay if I show these guys my dad's room? And he's like, yeah, no worries. So we go in and we're, and there's all these massive movie posters everywhere. And we go into this huge room and sit down and I'm like, who's your dad? He's like, Hans Zimmer. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so I was just like, oh my god. So anyway, so I was my mind was completely blown and um so she she told me a little bit about how, you know, how people come through as interns and maybe you get hired, maybe maybe nothing will happen, but if that was something I was interested in and I was like, oh yeah, absolutely. So once I got my green card which would allow me to do that, I got back in touch with her and then I I went into the studio and met the studio manager and she she gave me a shot basically and then um yeah, so I was working there as an intern for several months, but also very luckily on my second day, I got hired on, on a trial basis for Matthew Margeson for his assist, to be his assistant uh, for a, like a two month trial. So yeah, it was completely like, you know, that doesn't necessarily help anyone as far as like, how do you get in? Because that was definitely very lucky. <laughs> but I, I think the take home, at least for me, would be like to tell people what you want to do, because you just never know who you're talking to and if they want, yeah. if if they can help you and 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 in the meantime, learning as much as you can about as much as you can, so that when you do get that chance, you're like, you know, ready. And it, and it will happen at the most random time. I mean, for for me, I was like almost thirty years old, which, like, compared to everyone else who was an intern, I was like ten years older than everyone. You know, so that was that was an advantage in some ways because I guess I had more life experience and could read a room better, maybe. But at the same time, you know, I was often told, "Are you are you sure you want to do this? Like, you know, you're only." you're already 30 of us like I'm you know I'm in hands of the studio I'm gonna do whatever I'll clean the toilet whatever you know <laughs> so you, just man. having that like you know yeah. what I mean like yeah yeah so I was really and I wanted to do uh Zoe proud as well forgive because you know I think I was the first person or one of the first people she gave that opportunity to you know so I wanted to make sure I worked my ass off and she yeah. didn't regret giving me that chance so well, maybe we'll circle yeah. back in a little bit because I'd love to hear a little bit more about what it's like to assist for a major composer like a Hans Zimmer and how that's different from, you know, working in a conventional studio environment. Maybe we'll circle back to that uh, just to get a, a smattering of some more perspectives and backgrounds here. Lolita, I'd love to jump over to you next, if that's all right. Um, can you give us a sense for your journey? You came in a probably a more conventional way where a professor would tell you, this is how you get into film scoring. You learn how to score and then, and then what? Well, I, I mean, there's some traditional aspect to it. Although I didn't go to a traditional university. I went oh. to a school that is, is now defunct called uh, the Dick Grove school of music. And it was, mm. it, it was a trade school basically specializing in contemporary music, jazz, pop, film scoring. Um, and it was, it was the place to be. I mean, I did the the traditional college tour uh, when I was a senior or junior in high school, and I was I wanted to be the next Carol King. I, I wanted to be you know singer songwriter, but I I knew I had to be in Los Angeles, and so we did the tour. And somebody at UCLA said, "Well, I think you are really looking more for this type of place." And so uh, we went to look at this the Dick Grove School of Music, and I heard you know I heard jazz in one room. I was hearing this epic film scoring music in another room, and singers and. And it was the pl it was the great place for me to land and to to study there for two years. And um, straight out of school, um, then I was still what was I nineteen, barely twenty. And um, I my one of my first jobs was basically the mailroom of film scoring, which was the music library. So I ended up working at the Warner Brothers Music Library. Um, proofreading parts, taking scores, taking parts to the recording stage. But meanwhile, I mean, I'm I'm walking over a, a stack of parts to put on all the various music stands, and I'm I'm a fly on the wall with Bill Conti conducting or Henry Mancini, and you know the a long list of these famous you know heavy hitter composers. And actually, you know, circling back to what Jason was talking about, my first my real break. Um, well, I orchestrated for Michael Kamen. And um, Basil Polidorus, and um, simultaneously, um, I was being recommended to a composer named Shirley Walker. And Shirley Walker is an, is an icon for for all composers, but she's definitely the trail was the trailblazer. She's since deceased uh, trailblazer for for women composers and diverse voices. And she was the conductor. She was Hans's conductor for a long mm -hmm. time. Hans Zimmer's conductor. So. Um, 
it was one of these situations where she was doing all this work for Hans Zimmer and Danny Elfman. And she had, she had her, an opportunity to score this little unknown project called Batman, the animated series, which has gone on to be like this legendary animated series that everybody reveres. And I was one of the lucky ones to be asked to, if I would be interested in working for Shirley and interested led to her hiring me to first to orchestrate for her. And then uh, eventually I was, I started writing uh, cues on cues, which is a, a music piece within an episode cues on a particular episode. And then I got my own episodes. And I mean, this was one of these situations where it was very much, I started out as an assistant and, and it led to me being able to get my own work in that sense. But I think the key really was, um, having having a vision of what I wanted to do and being and being really good at all the different aspects of it. So even though I didn't get it right out of the gate, I wasn't writing my my magnum opus film score. I was I was excited to be at the recording sessions. I was excited to learn, and I mean, it was kind of learning on somebody else's dime at first, and actually getting paid for it. And um, then I then that translated into you know fast forward to today where, you know, I can look back and me, I think I've, I've had a period of being out of work maybe for, I don't know, the longest was maybe four or five months, but it's like one of these things where you just always have to keep this machinery going, have to produce great sounding stuff. You have to be at the top of your game and, and it is a business. So for, mm -hmm. you know, for people interested in, I know we're going to talk about that later, but that's, it's very important to keep that part nurtured as well, how to, how to make those connections. So. Right. I'm super interested in hearing more about that. And I'm really curious also about the beginning parts of your career first in getting into uh, library music. I think that's something that a lot of musicians should know more about because there's always opportunities and there are just the incredible amount of volume of music that's created. And again, orchestrating for working alongside a more senior composer. And I'd love to understand a little bit more about what that process was like towards the beginning. Let's circle back to that in a second. Let's get the origin stories of uh, our next guest, uh, Christopher, if we can get a sense for where did you come from and how did you segue over into the, the film and video world? Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I, I'm from a really small uh, rural town in Oklahoma called Altus, surrounded by cotton farms. And there wasn't a whole lot of music diversity uh, where I grew up, but I was always into music that I felt like pushed creative boundaries. I remember I went to this little shop called Hastings, which is like what sold, it wasn't a little shop. I think it might've been like a chain in Oklahoma, but uh, they sold CDs there. It was the only place you could get CDs in my town. And so I remember going and I, I had to special order everything. I remember special ordering Bjork's Vespertine and Radiohead's Kid A and then also, like, if I wanted anything like jazz or bebop, which I was obsessed with, I was, I remember I was turned on to, like, new music by watching Conan O'Brien. I don't know if you guys watched the show, like, back in the day, like, in the late 90s, Conan was, like, the spot. Like, all of the, I, I feel like all of these, like, super cool artists were going on his show. And I saw this jazz guitarist named John Pizzarelli uh, play, the, play the Conan O'Brien show, and it, like, blew my mind. I was like... I want to do that. I want to play, I want to play guitar like that. Um, so when I went to college, I studied uh, jazz privately um, and then ended up teaching like bebop guitar right after college. I did that for a year. And then I came to LA for some sessions. Um, I was playing with this British artist who flew me out. It was like my first huge session, like in Los Angeles. I was so nervous. I got fired from it actually. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you do? Dude, it was like the worst. It's it's a completely other story, and it is a freaking nightmare of a story. But um, I learned the lesson, don't try to please everyone. That was a lesson I took from that is do your thing, do it well, and if you know, and 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 stick to it. I was trying to please too many masters and do too many different things at the same time. Right. Uh, but uh, but anyway, that trip led me moving to Los Angeles. I thought, man, this is an awesome town. I really liked the people. And I felt like maybe I could make something of myself here. Um, I worked at the Apple store for my first two years in town, um, trying to make ends meet. And then one of my best friends said, Hey, I'm quitting this job that I feel like you would be great for. And I said, what is it? And he said, it's for a film composer named James Newton Howard. Um, and I said, yeah, I sure. I'll, I'll, it's better than being on my feet for eight hours a day. Like I'm, and it's, and it's in music. Like I would love to see what this is all about. And I didn't know anything about film music, nothing about film or TV. 
Um, and I went and interviewed for it and James hired me on the spot. And that led to me working for him for six years, six of the best years of my life. Um, I got a tremendous education working there. Um, and whenever you ask, what, you know, it, it, when people ask me advice on like what to do, if they get those jobs, I always say, keep the kitchen clean. <laughs> Nothing makes your boss happier than whenever the kitchen is kept clean. Like when they see you when they're doing dishes and washing out mugs, like there's just something that bosses love yeah. about you doing that. Um, but I was hired as an assistant and I wasn't like really doing anything creative. Uh, and then I played uh, lap steel on this Tom Hanks movie called Larry Crown. That was like my first film credit. Oh, and cool. uh, from that, James said, hey, I, I didn't even know that you were a musician that you, and I was like, yeah, no, I, I, I play a few different instruments and, and I'm also really into synthesis. And then that led to him just giving me more and more opportunity. Um, anything he gave me, I ran with. I mean, if he asked for one thing, I'd give him 10. I mean, I just wanted to, really go above and beyond and hustle, you know? Um, and then after I left his studio, after that six year stint, uh, I opened up a music house called in-house music and sound. Uh, we're like you said, we do custom music and sound design and mixing and mastering for commercials. And also while I was at James's studio, I started working for other composers. So, um, I started working with Rob Simonson a lot and, uh, another composer named Dustin O'Halloran. I worked with him a lot. And, and yeah, so from there, I kind of branched out and uh, then kind of found my niche, which I think that we'll talk about a little bit later. Very cool. All right. Uh, let's uh, bump back over to Jason, because I'd love to go to this next part of the conversation where I'd love to get some thoughts about what you've learned from your journey that you think other people could take away from. I think you had a, a killer insight so far, Jason, which is that a, tell people what you actually want out of life, because some of it can help. And you're surprised by how much people actually like to help, you know, if they can. And then be good enough that when the opportunity knocks that you can actually do something with it, which is big. But I'd love to get a sense for actually starting and moving from intern to assistant, I imagine is a big part of just proving that you're decent enough to be around and reliable and all of that. But once you get into the assistant role, or maybe you're working more closely with people. First of all, what is that like when you're working with a major film composer? What does an assistant do for a film composer rather than, say, in a conventional studio environment? So I um, just want to make sure nobody misconstrues that I, I was never Hans's assistant, in case that right. was implied. Um, I, I got him coffee. I got him. I decided what he ate for, for dinner and things like that. <laughs> but uh, um, I was never his assistant, but I was Matt Marderson's assistant from, from I early on. Yeah, Matthew Marderson, intern yeah. for Hans and then assistant yeah. for Matt. Yes. Yeah. And Matt, I mean, Matt is arguably definitely an up and coming and quite major composer now. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and he, he had also worked on, uh, some big films with Hans where I could be in the room and seeing Hans and him work together was definitely awesome. Um, but yeah, a lot of what Chris was saying as well, like, um, you know, sh putting everything into any little thing. Like I was, I was like, like you, like I was in the kitchen all the time. The dishwasher broke. I hand washed everything. Yes. Like, yeah. you know, and it's amazing because like people can, people are judging you based on that. It's like, if you're yeah. going to do, if you're going to put everything into this, then maybe you'll be reliable for other things and, and having pride in the studio like I, I would it would be my worst nightmare if hands walked through and there was like trash everywhere or the bathroom wasn't clean or you know so so having that that's really you know you can't overemphasize that like how much effort you put into whatever you're given um yeah and telling people what you do I mean there's definitely a balance like I wasn't going around harassing people and like telling them like I wasn't starting conversations, but if there was somebody standing in the kitchen waiting for the coffee to brew and they were obviously, they had four, four and a half minutes to do nothing. So then I'd start chit chatting and it was kind of like a slow, gradual thing where I would, you know, pe or people might ask me, what are you up to and so on. But yeah, and being an assistant for a composer, um, I mean, there's varying degrees of, of what that entails, like depending on who you work for, but it's, it's pretty much like making sure their studio is working getting to know how their studio works. So when they're not there, you're still there, like, you know, trying things out or, you know, trying to think, you, you have to be really proactive as well. So part of it is like trying to foresee problems that might happen if we don't change this or that, or, you know, suggesting ways to improve workflow or, you know, this computer is crashing all the time. Why don't we move this from there to the, so it's like a lot of proactive, like solution oriented stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
and just like keeping a positive attitude and even if you're tired and worn out like doing your best not to let anyone else know right. that you know um so yeah. and then a quick two-part question just to piggyback on this uh, whole idea in addition to these uh, super important practical ideas are there any creative lessons that you took away from either watching hands or mad at work that you integrate into your own creative process i think one of the biggest things i learned was um I guess it's kind of a philo philosophical thing, but when but before I was in the film music world, if you wrote a song and you spent a long time arranging it and getting it how you like it, if somebody gave me feedback, maybe it's also because I was like 20, but you know, I, I would take it more personally and, and feel it as like I would defend the music. Whereas as a composer, you're in a it's a you're in a service industry more. So it's like you're make, you're helping the film be better. So if the if the director or the composer you're writing with has issues with the cue and they want to change it it's like okay let's you just have to be w that willingness to keep going back to the drawing board like however many times and and making sure whoever's working with you is beyond happy rather than mm -hmm. like i mean yeah there might be the odd time where you defend your cue or whatever but it's like only having gone through a few other options and so that was a massive lesson for me and and you know i'm, I'm glad i learned that early on yeah, yeah. that's a great point that uh, to a degree when you're doing the film composer role there's a degree to which you aren't the artist you're still the artist and an artist but there's a degree to which the film is the artist and mm. you're a service provider uh to that artist the film uh so definitely interesting takeaway and then what were your first creative breaks where you got to start to express yourself as the songwriter that you already were in the context of uh film and how did those come about and, and how did you tackle them I mean, I think from what I can remember, I think it was actually the guitar, which is like my probably my second instrument, just because Matt needed some guitar on something and he remembered on my resume, it said that I play guitar. So it was not my, it was not the way I expected it to go, to be honest. So it was actually doing guitar for him and then other people found out that I play guitar. I mean, I wasn't the only guitarist in the place, but it was like, I helped fill that void between using sampled guitars and when they get to the point where they hire a session guitarist. So it would be like for the demo, I would play guitars and things. And then um, and then also occasionally they needed songs in films or they needed like a, a big track replaced, but they didn't have 300 grand to pay for, you know, M83 or whatever. So then I'd, I'd, I'd get to have a stab at things like that. Mm, as well. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, Lolita, I'd love to ask you uh, a little bit as well about your kind of beginnings there. Um, you first started in library music. For those people who don't understand what library music is, well, can you tell I, us I just have to interrupt you because Please. I didn't actually write library music. I worked in the Warner Brothers Music Library, which are different things. Oh, so first of all, can you explain what both of those things mean? Because I only know what one of them means. Okay, well, uh, music library, music preparation is the step that happens after the music has been composed, let's say you have, you've written your, your, your music and you're going to have live musicians play it. You're going to have, you're going to, you've used sample strings, but you're going to have live violins, celli, brass, whatever live instruments at your session, you need to take what you've done in your setup. And then you need to have a score prepared and that people use Sibelius or Finale, one of those programs um, or other programs. Uh, so you have a score, and then from the score, the parts, each individual musician's part gets extracted. So in the old days, it was all done by hand, but it's the same idea that you do need to have the actual, you can't just magically transfer what you've done in your computer and just magically have the live musicians know what to play. So the music preparation is often uh, part of a music library um, department. I mean, the departments in most of these studios are no longer full-on buildings of, of a bunch of people copying music. Um, but it's, that's, that's what, that's where I got my start in that. And that is still an actual valid, very, um, necessary job to be an orchestrator and to also handle the, the very logistically tedious, but important for detail part of creating these parts and making sure that the musician that, I mean, cause it, can you imagine if you have a hundred piece orchestra on a recording session and you're missing, all the brass parts aren't there and the musicians are sitting there waiting for their parts or, or there are a bunch of wrong notes. And so that's all, it's, it's a very kind of tedious, tedious job, but it's, that's, that's, that's the part that I started. The other music library work that you're talking about is actually music libraries. And that is, there's so many of these uh, music libraries where, where they have, they have featured composers or they just, they just acquire, um, you know, maybe part or the entire publishing rights for a particular piece. And they have, 
you know, catalogs of, of music that's ready to be placed into any kind of a film. So you're not actually a, a composer isn't being hired to custom score a, a scene. Um, a composer's music is just being placed in there. And there's a whole technical thing of, you know, how much the licensing costs and who owns the rights and all that. But a lot of, um, I have not done that because I've been more in the, in the traditional sense of, I, I write to picture my, my, my process is all about collaborating with the director in film or in television. It's the producer that you're usually working with somebody called a showrunner or the actual producer, whoever the visionary is behind the project. And, um, my, um, my advice also as not just the like, oh, I have to be a, an assistant or I have to work for someone else to break into the business. There is that, that is one, one basic general direction that you can try that, that way. But, but another very important thing is to keep your, keep your own creative juices flowing for your own projects, your own creative voice, go and meet, meet up and coming directors, writers, editors, meet people that are not composers, mm. socialize with people that aren't composers, um, become their, become their friend, become somebody that they feel like they can have a camaraderie with and that they can develop a shorthand with as far as the emotion of what they're looking for in their film or their television show. And that, that is really, that's, that's the whole angle where you see so many films that come through Sundance or Tribeca or South by Southwest, or a lot, you know, hundreds of smaller film festivals where you have these gems of these, of these small independent films. And you, you have a composer, maybe and a director you haven't heard about, but now they've, they've worked together on something that is going to propel both of them forward. And with today's era of just massive amounts of content being available to all of us, it's a, it's an even better time, I think, for up and coming voices, or even not up and coming voices. Maybe people that have been in the business for years, but now have decided, you know, I'm really going to take a stab at at having my individual voice be heard, not be kind of a, an adjunct person for somebody else, but actually have my voice heard. It's a great time to to break into the into the world of film scoring and television production because it's just. There's so much content. We're just, we're absorbing it as a society. We're just, you know, we can't, you can't get enough of it. So. Absolutely. There's more music than ever being made. There's more sound yeah. than ever being made in part because every time you see a picture, practically these days, there's sound associated with it. Um, I do want to get a sense. So this is a great point that you bring up that one, you're looking for work in this field is important not to just network with people in the music industry, with fellow musicians, fellow composers, fellow music producers and audio engineers. A big part of it is network working with people outside of that circle. Um, and these people could be, have a different background than you. They have the film background, they have the production direction background, uh, the videographer background. So broadening out your circle to meet those kinds of people who are more likely to lead directly to some of those gigs is absolutely a great idea. But early on, you said you did work a little bit before uh, landing a lot of solo composer gigs as an orchestrator for another composer. Can you tell us what that process is like and is that still relevant today? Well, it absolutely is because um, gen generally speaking, when a composer is on just a, an incredible success streak where he or she has multiple television shows going at once and films, um, unless that person is taking some sort of uh, extraterrestrial super drug that allows that person to produce all this music themselves, there is usually a huge team of composers behind that composer also um, uh, flushing out and realizing, writing, addition, composing additional music. Um, uh, I always, I always idealize the fact that I hope that that people are getting credit for what they're doing because there's a lot of, there are a lot of um, elves and, and uh, you know, Santa's helpers that are getting that work done. So, I mean, I, there's a classic story of a, of a very well-known film composer that was, uh, was previewing some music for a, a director and the director didn't like the particular music he was hearing. So the director and the composer went and had dinner. And when they got back from dinner, there was new music ready for the director to hear. Wow. So I'm just saying there's, you know, there's a lot, lot of people working behind the scenes to actually make all this stuff happen. But yes, orchestration is anything from, from taking a, like, for instance, if you are orchestrating for John Williams, you all, all the choices of this is going to be piccolo. This is going to be the trum bass trombone. This is going to be the second viola. Those choices are made, but it still has to be 
stretched out basically from a sketch. It's like you have a, you have a sketch where you have the, all the ideas specified, but you still have to realize it for the full orchestra so that it actually, the, the, the logistics of having that music played, adding, you know, adding all very important details. Is the music going to be soft or is it going to be loud? All the dynamics and the phrasing. So that orchestrator, orchestrator can paint with a, with a very detailed brush. Um, there's also a situa- many situations where you'll get a, a demo and, and, you know, you'll get a MIDI file and it's just, you know, it's a polyphonic string pad that the keyboard player has played, but that, that no one knows magically that, oh, that's that your third finger, this note is going to be for the cellos. That, that all has to be then figured out and sometimes counter lines added, arrange, arrangement ideas. So it can go from very few creative decisions to huge amounts of, and then there's orchestration, which actually is ghostwriting too at times. So mm-hmm. people are orchestrators and they get, you know, notes that say atmospheric cue or something like that. Right. I hear you. Yeah. yeah. Understood. So there are cases in which the lead composer can be a little bit more of like a top line writer coming up with major motifs. And then some of the more incidental things are maybe overseen by that person rather than directly created um, in some context. Aren't, yeah. There aren't enough hours in the day often because it's um, what the, what the lead composer does, which is, which is sometimes by, by uh, some highbrow, highbrow contingency of the music, the music uh, branch. Sometimes it's like, Oh, that composer didn't write anything. That composer maybe wrote all, all the themes mm-hmm. set up the basic tone of the whole film dealt with 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 a director not liking something managed the whole creative voice of the film right. and that is a huge undertaking so if you're not on the line if you're not in the hot seat you know don't criticize somebody who is in the hot seat because they because it is really difficult to you know you have to want that you have to want that stress and some yeah, people as you're want scaling it. up to a degree i'd imagine it becomes a bit of a, a project manager gig and it does make sense too that since you have to kill so many of your darlings in music because the the director is going to say no the producer is going to say no the showrunner is going to say no that having that buffer of someone who maybe didn't write that one part of the cue and they're able to say well oh of course we'll kill that and it's easier maybe for the person who did write that one little section to have the liaison between the two someone who has the the soft skills in addition to the musical skills and it is amazing how when you get to the very high levels how much of this is a team effort and a a team sport and uh, you often find even though there's that myth of the lone creative genius that we all have, and you you got to curate it a little bit in your your own life to have that cachet, there really is tremendous efforts by by many people that go into this. And I think when you find a lot of the biggest names that they're most honest, they're quick to tell you that that there's a lot of people that go into to making uh, them a success. Um, I'd love to keep on circling through into the the next ideas. Uh, Other big question I had for you guys was about having a niche as opposed to diversifying your skills. I'd like to hear about each of that. Maybe we'll go back in reverse order this time. So sticking with you for just a moment, Lolita, how do you see that balance between diversifying your skills, being able to work across genres, moods, and styles, and having a creative niche where it's easier to maybe network and find new business in that niche or just easier for you to work with in that niche? Do you think it's important to have a niche? And how do you balance those ideas of having a niche that makes sense for you and having diverse enough skills to be able to work on uh, several types of things? Well, Justin, it's a, it's a great question. And the idea of having a niche is is really something until until we you know, talked about this earlier, I, I had not really thought of what the niche is. It's more about there, there's just a natural flow that happens that one, your last job, your next job is probably because of you did a good job on the previous job. And sometimes you're, you're being asked to kind of recycle yourself because you're good at something. And so you're going to you know, keep doing this. And if you, if we as creative beings, we have kind of a creative soul, I think. And then we have the personality that we present out to the, to the business world. When those two meet and we are creating something that we are getting paid for, but we are also creating something that is uh, comes from the inner depths of what we feel is our true essence as artists. That's where the the incredible magic happens, and that's an I- idealized hope that we all should 
I think we, we all kind of strive to have that happen. And it's, and it can be, it can be the my, my most minute thing that just gets us so excited, but that's not going to necessarily sustain a, a, a career to always only just do the things that are just your absolute magic making things for your personal self-satisfaction for your creative soul. Mm -hmm. So you, I think as a, if you are looking for a career in this business, if you have, if you can get excited about things that maybe aren't in your, aren't your niche, but that are some, that you're just a very, you're very good at your craft. You're either extremely good programmer. You're, you're, you're great at mixing. You're a great musician. You can be, you can offer the, you can do score an independent film by playing a lot of it yourself because you're a great guitar player or you're a great cellist and, and a keyboard player. Uh, the more you can, the more you can immerse yourself in the process. I think the more you find out what, what it is that, that kind of makes you tick. And I think if you're really unhappy, if, if you, if you, if you're always feeling like you're lacking something and you're waiting for that next big thing, that's going to happen that will make you happy. It's really not the business for you. Um, I think, you know, having some excitement about all of it is really, I, I think it's kind of the key. I mean, it's not all, it's all, it's not all wine and roses for sure. There's, there's a lot of, a lot of rough times where you just feel like, uh, screw it. This business is too hard, but, uh, you know, then we have community and we can help each other. Couldn't agree more. It's going to be lovely for a lot of people to hear someone of your stature saying something like that, you know, that there's uh, moments of doubt, even in such a, a great <sighs> long career with so many uh, accolades in it. So, I mean, if people look through your discography or filmography, I guess you'd call it. Uh, it's uh, it's astounding. So knowing that um, you're always going to have those moments where you th you're thinking about what should I be diversifying into to get the next gig is uh, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. <laughs> After we're done today, I have to make some more demos and yeah. I have to, I'm going to read a script and I don't even have any idea if, if I'm one of a hundred that will be reading the script or one of five and I'm going to mm -hmm. give it my all to try to get the job. But no, it's, it's, you gotta, it's, in, you gotta, very few people have this, this easy train where they, they have success and then they don't have to even work. They've just, everything's handed to them on a silver platter. Always, Nothing in life moves in a straight line for sure. Nope. Yeah. Uh, Christopher, uh, I'd love to hit you on that uh, same idea about uh, having a niche or finding a niche. And how do you find that balance between diversifying skills, making sure you can take on different types of work and really specializing in something that uh, makes sense and is a path of least resistance for you? I actually don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I feel like I found my niche because of my diversity of skill. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was, I, I've always really admired people that have this calling card where they can say, I do this one thing, you know, like I, I used to tell Rob, uh, my buddy all the time, like, dude, you can just tell people when they say, what do you do? He can say, I'm a film composer. Like that makes sense. And I feel like there's almost a part of, you know, it, it delegitimizes me. I feel this is just an insecurity of mine, but I almost feel like delegitimized whenever I say, you know, I get into the nitty gritty of the different things that I do, but all of those things like playing pedal steel or, you know, producing hip hop beats or make like being a fanatic about modular synthesis, all those things have kind of coalesced into what I would consider my niche, which, which is kind of taking this music production approach to film score. I noticed a lot of the composers I was working with when I would be doing sessions as a guitar player or uh, doing pedal steel stuff that, you know, Lolita said it best. Like, I think a big part of uh, being a film composer isn't the music. Like that's uh, obviously a part of it, but there's so much more to being a composer than just working on the music. And those things keep composers really, really busy. And um, I work now at uh, Blake Neely's studio, Cow on the Wall Studios in North Hollywood. And Blake is on 50 million, pro like that dude is one of the busiest guys I've ever worked with. Um, the caliber in which he works and writes is just astounding, but he doesn't want to take 20 minutes to come up with a synth sound that nobody's ever heard before. Like he didn't have the time for that, mm -hmm. you know? And that's like, that's where I kind of found what I love about film and production and kind of married the two is, uh, I'll just use like a, an actual real world, real world example. We worked on the show called Emergence that was on ABC last year. And the way our process was that we would go downstairs, we would watch the episode, we would kind of talk about the music and what was going to happen. And then he would either write a, just a quick sketch 
and then send it up to my room. And I would just go to town creating these sonic layers, whether they were ambient or come up with these specific synth parts. And then I take all of those parts that work with that cue and I create instruments out of those sounds to be reused later. So by the time we're done with like three episodes, there's like a folder of so many sounds that he can go through and choose from and bring into Ableton or Logic and then mess with them and make them fit another cue. Um, and and p- part of the fun for me is, you know, we're downstairs and he'll say, man, I want something right here that goes wah, wah, wah. And I'm like, I know exactly what you mean. And I go upstairs and I'll make like five sounds like that. And then after I make them, it's like the job isn't over after I make them. I get to see what he actually does with them. Um, and the way that the creator, the way that composers treat the material that I've prepared for them is so rewarding for me because I get to hear different interpretations of the sounds that I made. Um, I prefer to work two cues instead of just pulling out of thin air. And I do that too. I had a session yesterday where a composer came over and we were just making like a palette of sounds for this film that he was about to start working on. But whenever I have context and I'm watching a cue that a composer is kind of loosely started, but left a lot of emptiness for me to fill. I feel like that's kind of when the magic happens. Um, and I can create, help really guide and create like a sonic vision for the score. Um, so that's, that's, I don't know if that answers your question, but I feel like that's kind of my niche is kind of mixing sound design, um, synthesis, uh, real instruments, and then also processing them in a myriad of ways. I have a ton of outboard gear, um, that I process sounds through, whether it be modular or, you know, the electron octatrack or whatever, they just get. Yeah. This makes a lot of sense. And I think there's going to be a lot of people in the uh, more conventional sonar works, uh, sound ID kind of audience who love to hear that, that there is a place for them to be music producer and obsessed with sounds, uh, within the world of, uh, film scoring. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to turn it over to you, Jason. Uh, do you have any ideas on this whole idea about, uh, finding a productive niche for yourself, uh, versus maybe diversifying skills and how you find that balance in your career? Yeah. I mean, for me, s- similar to what Christopher was saying, um, but also like, you know, it's not necessarily up to us to decide what our niche is. You know what I mean? It's like, what do people want you for and what do they keep hiring you for? And and so, especially at the beginning of your career, I feel like that the fact that if you can do a few things or you're willing to like do orchestration, even if you'd rather be composing or you're willing to do sound design, even though you may rather be writing the music or, you know, finding a myriad, oh, sorry, is that even the right word, finding the fusion between the two. You know, so that was that was definitely a thing for me. Like, I, I I think the first opportunities I had were like adding, like I said about the guitar, and then it would be adding percussion, or it'd be like adding sounds, or like adding the non-orchestral elements to cues and things like that. So yeah, I think, um, and that's kind of <laughs> become my niche as well. Like, kind of happy to fill in the the gap of whatever it is. Like for some some of my projects, I'm actually the the orchestrator for like this guy that does trailer tracks and he he'll sketch it out and then I do sorry not orchestrate but I will like reprogram all his orchestra that he's done on like one patch and make it sound alive and so on whereas for other people I'll add the big drums and the massive synths to their orchestral stuff so you know I I think the and also I just enjoy a lot of the diff- like I'm doing a mastering course right now just because I've you know having a bit of relative downtime and I love mixing and and I think also I'm jumping around a bit. I might have ADD. Um, like you, I think your niche evolves as well, like over time. So like 20 years ago, mixing was really stressful and I'd hated it, and now I I love it. You know, so like as you get older, maybe you start enjoying different, or you maybe you enjoy the variety of, of different things, and 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 also like you're able to fill in the gaps in your in your career. So if if I have like a movie, like for example, I I was meant to be starting on a film in January that's now been cancelled so it's like okay well now i can do some other things so i'm like doing some mixing doing some mastering blah, blah blah you know so i think it's an asset to have interest in in a few things especially at the beginning and then maybe you keep getting called for the same stuff and then that becomes what you focus more on if that makes any right. sense Great. Uh, yeah. One last question I'd love to ask you guys just about the business side of it and kind of where work comes from. What's your sense for the divide in your world as far as 
referral work and repeat clients versus going out and networking and finding totally new clients? What do you, would you say the split is in your career between those things? And then when you are trying to go out and seek new projects, new collaborators, what have been some of the most fruitful avenues for you to kind of uh, sync up with people who are likely to be into the kinds of things you can do? Um, maybe we'll go backwards this time through Christopher. Um, that's a really good question. I, I, I'm I'm probably going to look be looked down upon for saying this but like I kind of feel like network is a four letter word like I don't I don't really it, it just that's never really felt authentic to my approach um I like to reach out to people and work with people that I have a genuine interest in and I've been super fortunate in my career especially since I've been kind of varied because I do play in bands and I work on uh, music outside of film, um, and I and I you know run my commercial music house. It kind of allows me the freedom to work with people that I love and and and, it, and I'm excited to work with, um, as opposed to feeling like I need to get out there and 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 network, if you will. Um, ever since I moved out here, I've been kind of dedicated to this idea of making like meaningful relationships with the people that I'm around, and that doesn't happen all the time. I'm not trying to act like everybody I meet is going to be my best friend, but I, I do keep the, the possibility open for these meaningful relationships to develop. And I would say that most of the work that I get is a product of those relationships. But the catch is if you're in those relationships for that byproduct, it's, I don't think that's really the best look, you know? Sure. Um, yeah, people I, I, do I, can have a misconception about, you know, um, what it should mean and when networking when practiced in that four letter word way that you're describing can be very off putting. You can really smell when someone's trying to get something out of a relationship rather than expressing genuine interest and then figuring out, wait a second, maybe what you're doing is interesting. Let me legitimately okay. find out more about and, it. There's a different be, approach for sure. And to be super clear too, like I'm not really, I'm not against that either. Like mm -hmm. I, I'm actually just for authenticity. I mean, if somebody approaches me and says, you know, Hey, look, like I'm trying to do this and this, and you're my best chance of making that happen. It's like respect. I respect <laughs> your honesty. Like, you know, and, and other, and some people aren't looking for those kinds of like meaningful relationships with people. They just want to clock in, do the work and then go home to their families. And I respect that too. Right. It's just not my path. That's not how I've uh, chosen to kind of, I guess, craft the relationships um, in, in my career. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that is an answer to the question or not. No, that's, that's totally giving, getting your perspective on this is wonderful. Uh, I'd love to turn it around to Lolita because one of the things that you talked about was how important it is to you know, get to know people who are outside of the music world and connecting with people who are maybe screenwriters or directors or producers and, you know, getting to know people outside of just the music circle. And what have been some of the best avenues for you for that? Are you the kind of person who's going out to screenings or just constantly reviewing scripts? Like, what are the ways that you end up connecting with those people and finding the kinds of opportunities or, you know, projects that would potentially inspire you? Well, first of all, uh, Christopher, I totally agree with you that authenticity is key. And I, I think I act, people actually smell inauthenticity, inauthenticity a mile away. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's very exhausting. I mean, this particular idea of looking for work is, it's just the, it's the worst part of it, all of it. So <laughs> it's you know, not, but not why that, anybody got into the business, right? But that being said, I do think, I mean, I, I mentor quite a few students and, and I have a, this assignment that they have to do and it's, they have to reach out to 15 people a week and they put this, this, this into a spreadsheet, who the person is, how they know the person. If it's a cold, if it's a cold call, cold email, cold Facebook message, whatever it is, um, log all of it. And they also have to log how they felt when they reached out to that person, how they felt when they didn't hear back. You know, log all of it so that you can look back a year from now and you can see, oh my God, I did this for, I did this 15 a week for however many weeks and I, and I got these gigs or I, I got this, this friend that recommended me for something else. It actually does work. 
It's just a very tedious un, uh, and not fun process. So if you're not in the midst of a, a situation like, I mean, Christopher, as, as, as your, your life sounds so exciting because you are, you are hovering around with your talent around in, so, in, in quite a few very interesting pools. Very so, but if we are the lonely composer, like sitting at home in a quarantine with our gear, I mean, how do you meet people? Uh, you can. You don't ask somebody for an hour of Zoom time. Ask them for a ten minute coffee break on Zoom, or just or just look. If you watched a movie and you liked, you love the score, or you notice the editing, you notice that, or the cinematography. Look it up on IMDb. Write a little fan letter. Don't write four paragraphs. Write a little paragraph. Just start a relationship. And 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 it's you know we all know that networking is. We feel like it's a four letter letter word, and I and I do hate it. But I do think we can put other people out of their misery by making them feel comfortable at an event and going up to them and saying, "Hey, do you know anyone? I don't know anyone. Okay, now we can both not not know anyone <laughs> together, and we can hang out. You know." So it's just, you know, we got to, once you're comfortable in your own skin, putting yourself out there, I think life is much easier and, and stop, and don't overthink that you have to be somebody that you're not just try to be yourself and, and just, it's an exercise. It's a part of, part of the gig to, to be an educated person as to who's, who's, who's producing things, who's directing, who the editors are. You know, it's not all about you. It's really about everybody else. And once you figure out what that is, then you can, you can maybe, you're kind of more fun to be around because you're kind of educated, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and real quick, if I can say like to jump, on, to jump on the back of that, whenever you say it's not about you, it's about everybody else. The, one of the best pieces of advice I got right when I graduated college was like, never tell somebody that you want to work for how great of an opportunity it would be for you to work for them. Mm. Like, it just, it adds no value. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, and so I think there's a graceful way of, if you do cold call, or if you do reach out to people, I think it's awesome to express admiration of what you love about their work, but also in a, in a graceful and humble way. And I know it's not always easy, but like say why you would be great to work with them. Like, what do you have to offer? What is it that you do that could bring value to what they do? And if you're able to ride that line, and I think demonstrate that I feel like the success rate for return to emails, even if you're, they're not going to use you just the respect of like, okay, I see what you're doing. Like you reached out, you paid me a compliment, a genuine one, and you're offering, you're, you're, you're explaining where you would add value into my world instead of it just being all about, man, it would be so awesome for me to work for you. Oh, this is such a huge opportunity. I just feel like a lot of people don't want to, that, that doesn't bring value. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting observation that to a degree, by talking about what you can do, you're showing a greater interest in them because you're showing, you know, their needs, their wants, what they actually need help with. Exactly. And then all of a sudden you talking about yourself, it's through the context of what can I do to legitimately help you in your life be and do better. And that's much better than the all about me approach of, this would be great for me. And sometimes, I don't want to say bragging, but demonstrating what you can do for others really shows respect and kindness to them because everyone needs help. We all need help. Uh, totally. Your favorite composer, your favorite editor, your favorite director, they all need help and they got where they are because they accept help from people who are capable of giving great help. Big time. Um, and I also loved, I have to say, I love the exercises that you brought up there, Lolita, this idea of, you know, swallowing the frog and just reaching out to people. But one of the things that's amazing about that to me is that you mentioned that you're not going to get a gig out of everything, but that's not always the goal. Sometimes their friend refers you to something, but sometimes you can be that person where you aren't necessarily getting a gig or providing a service directly, but you find out what their needs are, you know that you can't fulfill them, but you can connect with them with people who can. And then you were just someone yeah. who helped and you were someone who helped two people. So I, I have right. like, and you let the oh, person sorry. off the hook a little bit by sometimes reaching out to someone, you know, they've hired someone else, but you just, you, you, they're your friend and, you, mm -hmm. and reach out to say, Hey, I loved your, whatever. I loved your, be specific about what you loved about their film or be specific about something. Don't just like globally say you love everything they did, but it's, it's make it okay to, to not get everything. Make it okay to just be somebody that is in their life that they, that is part of their creative circle. And people just like they can smell inauthenticity can, can smell sincere, 
specific compliments about things that you genuinely enjoyed rather than just smoke blowing. Oh, that thing was great that I never watched. People know (laughs) most of the time. Uh, Jason, uh, we've got to start wrapping up. I love your ideas uh, really quick on this topic. Then I'd love to get uh, a sense for where people can find out more about you and hear your work. Uh, So Jason, any thoughts on this idea of kind of creating new relationships uh, and having that lead to more fruitful careers for everyone? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with that, that, that shifts instead of like, how can they help me? It's like anytime I contact someone, whether I know them already or again, it's like having it in your mind of what you can do to help them. And if that happens to be something that gets you work, great. But more often than not, like I, I have a few colleagues that joke that I'm like their agent because I'm often getting them projects because I'll be talking to someone. Yeah, I'll be talking to some composer and he's like, oh, I really need some help with this. It's like super orchestral, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, you should ask my friend Phil or whatever, you know. And uh, and then, you know, you become, you help them because even though you're not getting yourself work, you become someone they trust because the people you're referring to them have helped them and then they come back to you and for other things or, you know, for more recommendations. So, so yeah, having that mindset of like how you can help them and also when the people you reach out to them you know you know it's not just all about the music it's like so yeah I really believe in that for sure and and also like the networking thing like forming these relationships making friends with people that's what it's all about like how, keeping in touch with them and it is a muscle as well so like it's it, I love that exercise of, of making people do 15 people a week like that um but you, you know you have to practice it you can't just expect to like be the ultimate like Mr. Charisma, Mr. and Mrs. Charisma, like as soon as you walk into an SCL screening, like, you know, you have to keep putting yourself in these awkward situations, and then you get more comfortable with it, I think. Wonderful. Great. I think this is a great topic uh, to close on. Thank all of you people for watching this. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, it. Definitely uh, comment down below if you have any additional questions or, or ideas you'd love for us to cover in the future. But I'd love to give a uh, big thank you to SonarWorks Sound ID for helping this conversation to happen. I'd love to give each of you an opportunity real quick to tell us a little bit about where people can find you uh, on the internet, where would be great places for them to find out more about your work. Oh, and let's start with, I'm the moderator, so I should tell you which one <laughs> like, of you is what? going now. Jason, let's stick with you for a second. Okay, so uh, jasonsuda.com um, and on Instagram and Facebook as well, I'm, I'm reachable on there. So yeah, feel free Good to say stuff. hello. Any recent projects or exciting upcoming ones that uh, you want to brag about? Um, I have some exciting upcoming ones where we're going to be working... Well, so part of what I'm excited about, and this is kind of a general thing, I can't say anything specific, but basically because I've been in, a, in the artist world and also in the film world, I'm hoping to be working with some artists that want to get into film music. So kind of helping mm. them, you know, write music to film and being a kind of like filling the gap between their knowledge and, but them also bringing their own musical identity to the project. So I have some stuff like that potentially coming up very cool and christopher where are the best places for people to find about uh you on the web and are there any particular projects upcoming or recent that you're especially excited about yeah um so my commercial uh music house is in-house music and sound.com um i think my website is christopherray.com although it is being revamped as we speak because it was getting a little long in the tooth um, and, uh, I have a project out that released earlier this year, uh, called ghost Leota is the name of the band. And it features myself and my buddy, Zach Ray, who is a killer musician in town. He plays with a band called death cab for cutie. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. And then, uh, James McAllister is on drums who also is in a, another famous band called the national. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the last member is John Spiker, who's in Tenacious D. And Mm. we all got together and made this super weird experimental synth album that was supposed to just be for us. And then we were really happy with how it turned out and we decided to release it into the world. So if you feel like checking it out, it's the the band is called Ghost Leota. Um, And uh, yeah, you might, you might like it and you might absolutely hate it, but it, it brings upon any kind of, visceral emotion, then I feel that we have done our job as artists. <laughs> Wonderful. Good stuff. And Lolita, what are the best places to find out about you and any particular recent or upcoming projects you've been excited about? Well, I have a, a website, lolitaritmanis.com, and I'm, on, I'm kind of active on Facebook. I know that's not the hip thing. I, I do a little Instagram. I do very little Twitter, but 
I'm on social media, so I'm, I'm generally posting about stuff I'm working on. Um, I'm working on Young Justice uh, that's on HBO Max. Um, I work with um, Michael McQuistion and Christopher Carter. The three of us uh, share that show, um, as we have also done a lot of our animation work together. Um, and then uh, I'm very excited about as soon as the pandemic calms down and we can have live music events again there's a live to picture concert called women warriors the voices of change and we premiered a concert um amy anderson is the executive producer but there's three of my symphonic works it's live picture symphony orchestra it's all about about uh women heroes uh gender parody global activism and it's a symphonic concert featuring the works of nine female composers we premiered at lincoln center and we hope to take it on the road Oh, very cool. All right. Exciting stuff. Thank you all for being part of this conversation. Really a lot of uh, wisdom in here. Uh, a lot of great takeaways for me. Uh, you guys, please let us know in the comments down below if you had any particular takeaways or favorite moments. Uh, definitely let us know. Remember to hit like and subscribe, all that good stuff. Big thanks once again to Sonarworks, now releasing Sound ID Reference. And as Jason and Chris said in particular, super useful for any of you who really have to deliver work to end clients where the sound has to be amazing and you have to make sure that your room or your headphones aren't holding you back in that regard. Everyone who's reviewed Sound ID over at Sonic Scoop uh, has loved it. Uh, when it was called Sonar Work Reference. And now that's called Sound ID Reference, they're still going to love it. But uh, really one of those <laughs> things that changes lives. You know, I, I see people's faces light up about how much just it made things easier. So big thanks to those guys. Big thanks to all of you for being part of this conversation. Thanks to you guys for hanging out with us. See you next time. Thank you.